This video will cover the Geometry Common Core exam from August 2015, questions 1 through 6. Question 1 says a parallelogram must be a rectangle when it's, and then we have to fill in the blank here. So we're trying to decide if the diagonals in a rectangle are perpendicular, the diagonals are congruent, the opposite sides are parallel, or the opposite sides are congruent. Now first, before we think about what a rectangle is, let's talk about what a parallelogram is. There's five important properties to a parallelogram. First, we know that opposite sides are parallel, hence the name parallelogram. Opposite sides parallel. But we also know that they're also congruent to each other. So there's two properties in one. Opposite sides are parallel and congruent. We also know that opposite angles are congruent. Additionally, we know that adjacent angles are equal to 180. They're supplementary. And remember that adjacent just means next to each other. And we know that the diagonals in a parallelogram bisect each other. So now if I take a second just to sketch a rectangle, sometimes a sketch can help you figure out the answer pretty much right away. Here I've got a right angle, of course it's a rectangle, opposite sides congruent. A rectangle is a very special parallelogram. So all of the properties that we just listed above in purple get carried on to a rectangle. So it's not enough to just prove opposite sides are parallel or opposite sides are congruent because that's just a parallelogram in and of itself. So now we have to decide what do we know about the diagonals. Are they congruent or are they perpendicular to one another? So if we sketch them in and I look at the diagonals where they intersect each other. Right here, right here. If they were perpendicular to one another, they should, making, should be making a perfect T, um, even if it's a sideways T, because that would mean that they make right angles. And you can see here that this angle is not a right angle, and nor is this one. So I'm going to guess that the perpendicular one is not our choice. But let me just sketch another one to be, like, sure about it. So here's a different type of rectangle where we, of course, again, know opposite sides are congruent and parallel. Ooh, when I draw in those diagonals, they are definitely not perpendicular. But if I draw them in, I can also see that they are the same length. And if you think about it, you have congruent triangles here because you have right angles. You have opposite sides that are congruent. And so the triangles are congruent by side angle side, which then means that any corresponding parts, like these diagonals, must also be congruent. So here, choice two is our answer for number one. Number two says if triangle A prime B prime C prime is the image of triangle ABC, under which transformation will the triangles not be congruent? Remember that congruent means same size, same shape. So we're looking at these transformations and trying to figure out what is happening and which one will not give us a congruent figure. Reflection is just like a flip. If I flip triangles, they're still going to be the same size as each other. So reflection is not our choice. Translation to the left 5 and down 4 is a slide. Translation is a slide. If you just simply take a triangle and you slide it up and down, that triangle is still going to be the same size. Dilation centered at the origin with a scale factor of 2. Whenever you see scale factor, that means that the triangle is either getting bigger or smaller by whatever the scale factor is. So say this side's 4, scale factor is 2, so that means multiply by 2. So if I'm multiplying side lengths, then my triangles are not congruent. So number 2 is choice 3. If you look at choice 4, it's a rotation. Rotation is the same as a turn. And our keyword for dilation is a shrink or grow. Number three says if rectangle below is rotated continuously about side W, what solid figure is formed? So I'm just going to kind of condense this little rectangle just so I can sketch this here. I'm going to rotate around this line here. And if I rotate, then anything, any point on that single line, on the red line, is going to stay the same. 
but this edge gets kind of rotated around here and I'm rotating, rotating. This top one does the same thing, this top vertice. So that means this edge here, this left side of the rectangle, kind of gets moved around the circle in a fashion like this. So if you take a look at that shape, we have a circular bottom, a circular top, and then we're connecting through. That means that our new figure is going to be a cylinder. Number four says, which expression is always equivalent to sine of x when x is between 0 degrees and 90 degrees? This is something called co-functions. It's just something that you have to memorize. There's no real good trick for it, except for the fact that you always have a sine and you always have it equal to a cosine. So if we're talking about sine of x, then cosine needs to be 90 minus x. Because the two values, sine and cosine together, should sum to 90 degrees. So if I take the angles x and 90 minus x and add them, it should be equal to 90. Think about these x's canceling, so then we have 90 equals 90. So if you were to have any expressions here, x and 90 minus x, that didn't sum to 90, then it wouldn't be a true equation because cofunctions say that this should happen. Sine of x should be equal to cosine of 90 minus x. So choice one is our answer here. So answers for one through four, we've got number one is choice two, number two is choice three, number three is choice four, and number four is choice one. Number five says in the diagram below a square is graphed in the coordinate plane. A reflection over which line does not carry the square onto itself? Does not carry the square onto itself. Carry onto itself is the same thing as map onto itself. And what we mean by that is if I take this square and reflect it over, say, this line, this square then becomes this one. This is not carried onto itself. But if I take this square and reflect it over this line, this vertice crosses the line and goes the same distance away. So it maps onto the opposite vertice. This vertice does the same thing. So now the square becomes exactly what it was before the reflection. It carries onto itself. So now we're going to take a look at this on the graph. Um, you want to take a second to sketch each of these lines. And remember that if you have x equals a number, that's actually a vertical line. If you have y equals an, a number, that's a horizontal line. So take a second to sketch those. If we have x equals 5, counting boxes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right, that would give you this line here. So if I think about reflecting this square over that line, this point up here is going to stay the same because it's on the line, no distance away from it. Same thing with this vertice down here. But if I think about this one on the far left, that's one, two, three, four, five, six squares away. So that means if I'm reflecting, I should go six squares beyond it over here. And same thing with the bottom left vertice. That would come over here. So now my new square is on the right of the original square. If I'm graphing it and it doesn't land exactly on top of itself like it did in this one example that I showed you, then it's not going to carry on to itself, which means that one should be our choice. But I do want to talk to you about some of these other options here because some of them seem a little weird. If we were to graph y equals 2, that would be the line segment that goes through 2. So if I reflect over y equals 2, this bottom left vertice lands on top of the top right vertice, or top left vertice rather, because it's 1, 2, 3 away, so I go 3 beyond it, 1, 2, 3. And same thing with any of the other vertices, they would map onto each other. The next one we have is y equals x. That's a line that goes on the diagonal. 
where the slope is up 1 over 1, 1 over 1, and the y-intercept is 0 because there's no plus b there. So that means we're graphing through this diagonal. This bottom left vertice would stay the same. The bottom right, or the top right vertice would also stay the same because it's on the line of reflection. But if you take a look at this bottom right vertice over here, it would map itself to the top left vertice. Because remember, reflections are perpendicular to the line of reflection. I'm not sure if that made sense. If you're reflecting, it should be perpendicular to the line of reflection. And also the same distance away, such that the line of reflection is now your perpendicular bisector. The last one that we have is x plus y equals 4, and I'm assuming that quite a few of you probably wanted to choose choice 4 just to begin with, because it looked different than all the other ones. But if you get it into y equals by subtracting the x, we have y equals negative x plus 4. So when I graph that, let's use a different color this time, negative x plus 4 means to start at positive 4 on the y-intercept. 1, 2, 3, 4, right here. And then go down 1 over 1 each time we plot a point. Down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. And I go backwards, go left 1, up 1. So now it looks like we have this diagonal here. And if I were to reflect the square, I'm not sure if you can even see it anymore with all these colors, but if I were to reflect this original square over my yellow line, it would in fact map onto itself. Very similarly, um, in the way that it did with y equals x. So again, final answer here is choice 1. Number 6 says the image of triangle ABC after a dilation of scale factor k is centered at point A, or centered at point A is triangle ADE as shown in the diagram below. Which statement is always true? So what we know here again is that a dilation occurred centered at point A. So we know that this distance is, say, x, which means that this distance is 2x if k were to be 2. Um, that also is the same thing here. This distance is y, so then the full distance is 2y. Again, if k is 2. If k were 6, then it would be 6y and 6x. So the distance is doubling. What we also know is that when a dilation occurs, the angle measures stay the same. Dilation, angles are congruent. So that means angle A, B, C, whether it's a right angle or not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we'll put an arc there instead. Angle A, B, C is congruent to angle A, D, E. Again, in a dilation, angles are congruent. So now if we think of our picture where we mark these angles congruent, these angles are corresponding. They match up, they're in the same position. And we know that corresponding angles are congruent if lines are parallel. Which then means that we can conclude that this line's parallel to this line. And so bringing that back to our picture, that must mean that BC is parallel to DE. Choice 4. So again, solutions for this page, number 5 is 1, and 6 is 4.